We're going to get into God's Word. We're going to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we're going to do it in a, a new series starting today called Dream to Destiny, Lessons in Life and Leadership from the Life of Joseph. And in the life of Joseph, God gave a very imperfect, flawed person. God's always in the business of partnering with imperfect people. If he wasn't, he'd have very few people to choose from, right? I mean, Jesus is the only one, right? So how, how God gave an imperfect, flawed person a dream that would help to lead him to his destiny. In Joseph's life, it was two literal dreams that Joseph had. But I want to encourage you that in your life, you'll either have a literal dream that will help to guide the course of your life towards your God-given destiny, or you can kind of use these terms interchangeably with, with the topic of this series. A dream, a vision, a calling, a sense of purpose for your life. That regardless of whether you get a literal dream like Joseph got two of that kind of shaped the course of his life towards his destiny, God wants every one of us to have a dream, a vision, a calling, or a sense of purpose in your life. And many people, increasing numbers of people in our culture today are dealing with the opposite. They're dealing with inferiority, insignificance, depression, or despair. And so you might, can we just all agree that increasing numbers of people are dealing with insignificance, inferiority, depression, and even despair, right? Increasing numbers of people are dealing with that, despite the fact that we're more prosperous, more technologically advanced, more socially connected, so to speak. And I believe that there's a lot of things you could point to, but the number one thing I think we could point to as the contributing factor to increasing numbers of people dealing with insignificance, depression, and despair is that we're removing God from the equation in our society. And when we, when we remove God as creator, as the giver, as the sustainer of life and life's purpose, it, it leaves a vacuum, a void that the enemy is feeling with the, filling rather with those lies of insig insignificance that leads to depression and despair. There's a prevailing mentality in our culture today that life is random. That all this just happened with the cosmic boom and evolution that you, your uh, ancestors were primates. And that life is just random, that there is no divine creator, that there is no sovereign God. And I'm just telling you, when you embrace that worldview, when you embrace that perspective, it's a recipe for insignificance, depression, and despair. Here's the counter truth, and this is the truth of God's word. You were created in the image of God on purpose for a purpose in such a time as this. And there's not one person who is an accident there's not one person who wasn't fearfully and wonderfully made, knit together, the Bible says, in your mother's womb. Psalm 139, verse 13. You created my inmost being. Your translation might say, my delicate inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. The reason why the mother's womb is such a sacred place right from conception and deserves protection is because the, the womb is a sacred place where the hand of God is at work, developing, forming, and fashion a person that was created on purpose purpose for a purpose. And if you've bought in in any way, shape, or form to that lie, that life is random, that life is meaningless, that what does life matter, what do, how does the way that I live, does it really matter, can I just live however I feel or however I want, I'm telling you today, those are lies from the enemy. There's a purpose, there's a dream, there's a calling, there's a vision that God has for your life. He created you for it. So the opposite, we see all this insignificance, depression, despair. The opposite of depression, I'll make a strong statement, but I believe it to be true. The opposite of depression is not happiness. It's purpose. And the world's chasing after happiness. And in a culture that's chasing after possessions and promotion, God is inviting us to live lives of purpose. In a culture that is chasing after status God is calling you to a life of significance, and there's no way to live a life that's more significant than getting to know God and God's plan, his purpose, his future that he created you for in your life. One of the greatest things about living in a relationship with God is that you begin to get to know his purpose, his dream, the future that he has for you. But here's the, 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 the truth that goes along with this, and I say this often. We see this borne out in Joseph's life, just like we see it borne out in the life of almost every person that God ever has used to do great and wonderful things. Whenever God gives a dream, extends a calling, or establishes a purpose for your life, he almost always starts a process. He almost always starts a process. Why, Pastor T? Well, because God's more concerned about our character than he is our calling. 
Because how many know it's true? You could, if you get to the calling without the character, what's meant to be a blessing can actually be a burden. What's meant to bring healing and hope to you and to others can actually be, bring hurt and harm. And how many know, I mean, you've seen it before. People have gotten the fame, the fortune, the influence, the followers, and without the character, without the foundation that is needed, and, and it's just a matter of time right before their life crumbles and falls apart. And so before God builds high, as I'm challenging you to embrace, to receive, to pursue, to believe, that God really does have a big dream, a big purpose, a big calling, a big vision for your life in every area of your life to embrace that before God builds high, he digs deep. He, before God builds something high, he, he's going to dig deep. He's, gonna, he's looking to establish character. And he might take you through some things that are intended to establish character in your life so that you can sustain and enjoy as you experience the big things that God desires to do in your life. So this brings us to the story of Joseph, Genesis chapter 37. Before we read the word, let's pray together like we always do. I'll pray over us corporately. You pray individually. God sees and knows what you're up against, what you're going through. He knows you. He's the only one that really knows. I love you. I'm grateful to be getting to know many of you better as we relate to one another in church family. But no one will ever know you. Even your spouse will never know you like God knows you. He knows you. He knows how he's wired you. He knows what he's created you for. He knows what you've gone through. He knows the unforeseen, unexpected things, the unfair things. He knows everything that you've gone through. He knows your story. He knows where you are today. And let's believe that if we believe that to be true, let's, let's pray. Let's turn our hearts. Prayer is turning our hearts towards God. And, 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 and in this case, asking him to speak to us and strengthen us and encourage us today. That's, that's my prayer corporately, right where you are. Would you just open your heart? Would you just begin to call upon the Lord where you sit? Maybe you just in the stillness of your spirit or right there under your breath, just, just ask God to speak to you, to strengthen you, to encourage you, to cause you to draw closer to him, to cause you to look more like Jesus at the end of our time together today, to cause you to be living by faith over fear, to cause you to once again have hope for your future. Lord, anyone who's, who's here in this room, anyone who's online, Lord, I, I I just know that anyone who's hurting or weary or weak or wounded in any area of life, Lord, spiritually, Lord, maybe spiritually dry, physically, maybe tired or weak or weary or hurting or dealing with an ailment, God, emotionally, dealing with anxiety or fear or doubt, God, relationally, dealing with strife or dealing with discord, God, or division, Lord, whatever it is, God, we thank you that today your heart through this word, Lord, my prayer, use an imperfect person, that being me, and an imperfectly prepared message to, to reveal the perfect heart of a good father who has a good hope, a good plan, a good future. Bring fresh faith, bring courage for the future, Lord. Bring healing and strength, redemption, restoration today, Lord. In every heart, every mind, every marriage, every family, every future, in Jesus' name. And come on, if you'll receive any or all that for yourself, give the Lord a big amen. 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 All right, so Genesis chapter, Genesis chapter 37, it says, this is the account of Jacob and his family. When Joseph was 17 years old, he often tended to his father's flocks. He worked for his half-brothers, the sons of his father's wives, Bilhah and Zilpah. Sound like lovely ladies. But Joseph reported to his father some of the bad things that his brothers were doing. Come on, no one likes a tattletale, right? And Jacob loved Joseph more than any of his other children because Joseph had been born to him in his old age. So one day Jacob had a special gift made for Joseph, a beautiful robe. Your translation might say, or you might have kind of grown up hearing this story with it called the coat of many colors, right? And that's what this is speaking of, this beautiful robe. But his brothers, verse 4, hated Joseph because their father loved him more than the rest of them, and they could not say a kind word to him. Sounds like a pretty dysfunctional situation, right? And that's, that's actually good news for some of us who maybe have some of our own dysfunctions, right, and our hang-ups. God can still use you. And one night, Joseph had a dream, verse 5. He told his brothers about it. They hated him even more, more than ever, it says. Listen to this dream, Joseph said. We were out in the field tying up bundles of grain, and suddenly my bundle stood up, and your bundles all gathered around and bowed low before mine. And his brothers, verse 8, responded, so you think you'll be our king, do you? Do you actually think you'll reign over us? And they hated him all the more. Because of his dreams, and catch this, this is significant, and because of the way he talked about them. And actually, was it because of the dream? It was really because of the way he talked about them. There was a way that Joseph could have carried this dream in his heart, pondered this in his heart, watched for God as he humbled himself to in due time exalt him into the position of the dream, but he made the mistake of opening his big fat mouth, right? And so his brothers hated him even more. 
because he had the audacity to share this dream, this vision, this calling, this purpose that God was extending to his life. Soon after, verse 9, Joseph had another dream, and again, he told his brothers about it. Come on, Joseph, get with the program here. He, he's a slow learner, all right? And listen, he said, I have had another dream. The sun, the moon, 11 stars bowed down low before me. He had 11 brothers. So many think this is his father, his mother, and his 11 brothers. And this time he told the dream to his father as well as to his brothers. But his father scolded him. What kind of dream is that? He asked, will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? But while his brothers were jealous of Joseph, his father wondered what the dreams meant. Verse 18, bear with me. We're going to read a lot of this. It's a good thing to read the Bible in church. Amen. Verse 18, they saw him from afar, and before he came near to them, they conspired against him to kill him. Yours might, your translation might say they saw him from a great distance. They saw him from afar. How, how'd, they, how'd they see him from afar? Probably because he was wearing that darn coat of many colors, even though it was summer, you know. It's 148 degrees in the Middle East, and he's still wearing that blasted coat because he had pride in his heart. And they saw him coming from a far away. They conspired against him to kill him. They said to one another, here comes this dreamer. Come now, let us kill him. Let us throw him into one of the pits. And then we will say that a fierce animal has devoured him. We will see what will become of his dreams. But when Reuben heard it, he rescued him out of their hands, saying, let us not take his life. And Reuben said to them, shed no blood. Throw him into this pit over here in the wilderness, but do not lay a hand on him. And Reuben said this, that he might rescue him out of their hand and restore him to his father. I want you to mark that. We'll close with this this morning. Reuben was the firstborn of all the brothers. And did you notice right here, Reuben is the only one that says, I'm going to preserve and rescue and restore him from the pit and restore him back into a relationship with his father. You might see where we're going to go with that at the end of this message. It says, when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the robe of many colors that he wore. They took him and threw him into a pit an empty pit where there was no water in it. In verse 26, Judah said to his brothers, what profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Let's sell him to the Ishmaelites and let not our hand be upon him. He's our brother, our own flesh, and his brothers listened to him. And then Midianite traders passed by and they drew Joseph up and lifted him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver and they took Joseph to Egypt. When Reuben, remember the one who desired to rescue and restore Joseph, returned to the pit, saw that Joseph was not in the pit, he tore his clothes, he returned to his brothers and said, the boy is gone, where shall I go? Verse 31, the brothers killed a young goat, dipped Joseph's robe in its blood, and they sent the beautiful robe to their father with this message, look what we have found. Doesn't this robe belong to your son? They knew he would know it did, right? Their father recognized it immediately. Yes, he said, it is my son's robe. A wild animal must have eaten him. Joseph has clearly been torn to pieces. Had, had Joseph been eaten? Had he been torn to pieces? And I touched on it a few weeks ago, but it bears repeating right now in this moment because it's such a powerful truth. That Satan is called the father of lies. It's the only place in the Bible where he's described that way, and it's the only place where he has creative ability is what it implies to us. Here's what that means is the enemy is so creative and clever and cunning and crafty at lying to you and I about ourselves, about our God, about your spouse, that he'll actually even produce evidence to back up the lie. It's what he's doing right here. Joseph wasn't dead. And, 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 and in your marriage, that marriage isn't dead. And, and in your physical body, you might really have the report, but you're not dead. And the enemy's always producing evidence to say, see, God's done with you, or see, it's not going to come to pass. And I'm just telling you, just because you could see it does not mean that you have to believe it, because we are called to live by faith and not by sight. So he, he's, he's got this robe, and it's got the blood on it, and he's convinced, surely Joseph is dead, but we know that God is actually working it all out behind the scenes. And it says that their, their, their father, Jacob, tore his clothes, dressed himself in burlap, mourned deeply for his son for a long time. His family all tried to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. And I will go to the grave mourning for my son, he would say, and then he would weep. Meanwhile, the Midianite travers arrived in Egypt, sold Joseph to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. Potiphar was captain of the palace guard. So at the end of the story, at the end of this series, we'll find Joseph in the palace, not as a slave, but as the second most powerful man in all the world at that day and time. But it starts with a dream. And through the life of Joseph, we can learn about how to handle, about how to navigate, about how to steward 
about how to pursue, about how to walk out the dreams, the vision, the calling, the purpose that God gives us in life. So let me encourage you from Joseph's life, seven truths about a God-given dream for your life. Number one is that you're, you are called to have a dream, a vision, a plan, a purpose for your life. No person that God has created is created without this built in to who you are. But like, like I say often, anywhere where there's power, potential, or promise, you can expect opposition. So the enemy works full time and overtime, in fact, to, cu- to cause us or to try to cause us to convince us that our life really doesn't matter to the plans or the purposes of God. Here, here's one, that we've blown it, that we missed the boat, that we missed our chance, that we missed our shot, that the window is closed, that we're too old or that we're too far gone. And I'm telling you today that those are all lies. There is a plan, a purpose, a hope, a future, a vision. There is a God-given, God-sized dream that he desires for you to have in every area of your life. Proverbs 29, 18 says, where there is no vision, and you can kind of insert right there, dream, goal, plan, purpose, where there is, your translation might even say prophetic revelation, prophetic vision, a word from God about who you are and about what he's doing in you and through you, where that does not exist. If you do not have that, it says the people are unrestrained. What's that mean, Pastor T? It means we make decisions carelessly and callously, not intentionally. But when you have a plan, when you have a purpose, when you know who you are, when you know what God is calling you to do and be, you, you begin to make intentions, decisions rather with intentionality. Does this decision and does this direction cause me to move forward towards the dream, the plan, the purpose, the vision, the calling for my life? And we tend to kind of relegate this to our job and our career, especially in America, right? When, when we talk about calling, purpose, vision, we almost always tend to think about job, occupation, career. It's not invalid. It's, it's valid, But there's actually a call from God to have a dream, a vision, a calling, a purpose for every area of your life. Did you know that you would be well served to have a vision for your marriage? Did you know that you'd be well served to have a vision for the way you're going to raise your children? To hopefully not just believe in God, but to know and love and serve the Lord Jesus Christ? Did you know you need to have a vision for your money, for your finances, for your fitness? For your personal faith, did you know that it's good for you to begin to ask God, God, give me a vision of the version of me that I am yet to see? Did you know that there's a version of you, man of God, that's more aware of the word of God, more filled with the Holy Spirit, more committed to be a man of prayer and worship and and, and sharing the things that God is doing in your life? There's a version of you that you are yet to see, only God has seen. And you would be well served to say, God, begin to give me a vision of what's possible as I just continue to just day by day. Step by step, press into you, look to you, lean on you, trust in you, grow in you, go deeper in you. So so you, you can have a vision about even your personal faith. Begin to see yourself closer to God. Begin to see yourself being used by God to lead others to know him. Did you know that ministry was never intended to just be delegated to preachers and Sunday school teachers? In fact, Ephesians 4 says that the primary responsibility of a pastor is to equip the saints for the work of ministry. And what would happen, what, what's possible if you kind of moved the, the markers of your faith beyond church attendance and participation? That's a good place to start, right? And, and beyond maybe even just kind of supporting or giving to the ministry of a church? And what if you begin to just imagine what is possible if you begin to say, what does it look like for me to discover the vision, the dream, the calling, the purpose of my life? That maybe you're an evangelist, and maybe you, you, you've... You've only really given that to maybe kind of the the business leadings or kind of the the entrepreneurial things, but maybe there's something that God's putting off. Maybe there's leadership on your life. And again, maybe because of the culture of the day, you've kind of been more given to kind of apply that to to the business things, the workplace, the entrepreneurial things. But what if there's influence that God is calling you? What if you're gonna be the one that's involved in leading people to the Lord and telling them about Christ and seeing them be baptized in the Holy Spirit and seeing people be healed physically, spiritually, emotionally, relationally, not just because you bring them to church, but because you begin to understand that God has a vision and a calling and a dream and a destiny and a purpose on your life, and it goes way beyond your job or your career. A job or a career is a good vehicle 
for, for, for walking out and expressing some of the things that God has wired into you. But there's, there's an invitation to have a dream, a vision, a plan, a purpose, a calling in every area of your life. I know I'm being redundant, but it's for the sake of emphasis for your marriage, for your family, for your fitness, for your finances. Begin to ask God to give you a dream, a vision, a hope, a plan, a calling for your future. And then it begins to tether you to that. Again, where there is no vision, people cast off restraint. We live carelessly and callously. When you begin to have a vision for your life, and one of them that Amity and I have is we have a vision of a big dining room in a house that we're yet to build or, or, or buy, and it has a long dining room table. It's so long that it requires multiple chandeliers to be hung over it, and, and here's what it speaks to me. I don't know if it'll physically ever happen, but here's what it speaks to me is when the enemy comes and he tries to disrupt or distract or divide or bring strife into our marriage or our family or tell you you married the wrong person, we have a vision and we say, we're not giving in, we're not giving up. Good marriages and godly marriages aren't ones that don't experience strife or problems or obstacles. They're the ones who turn to God and endure and persevere. And, and that's the thing that keeps us anchored. We know that there's, there are grandchildren and great-grandchildren that are called to sit at that table at Thanksgiving. And I don't know if it'll practically ever happen, but there's a vision that is causing us to live with intentionality forward towards the things that God has put in our hearts. So in, in your life, what's, what, what's the way that God could give you a vision? for Again, for, for your life, your marriage, your family, your finances, your fitness, your future. You're called to have a dream. Every one of you is called to have a dream, a purpose, a vision. We're all called to that. Number two, the dream was really from God. Spoiler alert, Joseph really ends up in the dream. He really ends up with the destiny that the dream is speaking to him. He really ends up in the place of influence, power, promotion, prominence, prestige, in the palace. The dream really was from God. You know what wasn't from God? The pride that was associated with it. And God doesn't despise greatness. He resists pride. That's what we're saying again. God doesn't despise greatness. He resists pride. And when you get a big dream, a vision, a purpose from God, the most important test that you and I will have to pass is the test of pride. And Joseph got himself in trouble, not when he received the dream, but when he decided to open his big fat mouth about the dream. Pride always demands a voice and a platform. And, and, and he had to talk about it. And he had to let people know. Yeah, I'm the, the youngest of the sons, but, do you, do you, but you got to know God has something big for my life. And he would have been well served to just keep his mouth shut and be quiet and just keep serving faithfully and humbly behind the scenes and trust God to raise him up and promote him in due time, just like the Bible says that God will do. And pride, here's why it's, it, it's, it's so problematic for us. Because pride's actually the original sin. It was not the apple and Adam and Eve in the garden. Did you know that? Pride was the original sin. There were three archangels, Michael, Gabriel, and Lucifer. One was a warring angel, one was a communicating angel, and one was a worshiping angel. Lucifer was the worshiping angel. And we find that pride was actually the original sin. Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28 is where you can read about it. For time's sake today, we'll just visit Isaiah 14, where it says in verse 12, How you have fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. You're cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. Watch what? Why? 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 Watch. Watch. The Bible answers it. Verse 13. For you've said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the, God, the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. In other words, I'll, I'll, I'll be like God. I, I, I kind of be the God of my own life is what he's saying right here. I, I, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Watch God's response. Verse 15, you shall be brought down to Sheol to the lowest depths of the pit. So the original sin was pride. Here's why it's so problematic. Pride is not just bad Christian behavior. When we're operating in pride, we're cooperating with the spirit of Lucifer. And the Bible says God gives more grace, James 4, verse 6. He gives grace. How many of you want the grace of God? How many of you want the grace of God? Well, every hand ought to be going. How many of you want the grace of God for your life, for your marriage, for your family, for your, for your future, for whatever God's called you to? So God gives more grace. This is why the scripture says God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. That word opposes is antitasso. It's a military term to make, that means set oneself in battle formation against another. So God is saying, I'm going to resist you when you're operating in pride. Why? Because he cares too much about you to allow you to prosper and succeed when you're operating in pride. Because pride, Proverbs 16, 18, goes before the fall. And it's still true today. God doesn't resist or despise, rather, greatness. He just resists pride. 
And as we embrace this idea that God really has a big dream, a calling, a purpose, a destiny for your life, we've got to understand right from the start, we're going to have to determine to win the battle over pride. Jesus, who was the greatest of all time, right? He's the real goat, not Tom Brady. Someone say amen. Who misses Tom Brady and not playing on Sundays, by the way? I don't, no hands going up. Yeah, we're moving on right now. That's, that was the result I was hoping for right there. He didn't get, come to get rid of greatness. Jesus didn't, but to model it for us. Mark 10, verse 41 through 45, James and John are being real knuckleheads. And they've come to Jesus and they've said, we got a favor to ask of you. And Jesus said, what is it? He said, would you make us the greatest? Would you put us at your right hand? And Jesus said, it's not for me to, to answer, to, to give those places. Only God has those places established. And, but it says in verse 41, is where we'll pick up the story. When the 10 other disciples heard about this, you can only imagine they're like, James and John did what? Those dirty dogs. It says they became indignant with James and John. Indignant. If you look up the word indignant in the original Greek, it actually has a connotation of like today it would be the same as unfollowing them on Facebook, all right? They were very peeved, aggravated, frustrated at James and John. And it says they became indignant with them and they went to Jesus and, 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 and Jesus called them together. And he said, you know that those who are regarded as rulers and Gentiles of the Gentiles rather lord it over them. Their high officials exercise authority over them. In other words, he's saying when people in the world get power, promotion, prestige, possessions, they utilize it and leverage it for their own good and their own gain, their own glory. But watch what he says. It says, not so with you. And he's speaking to you and me, not just the, not just the 12. He says, not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great, someone say great, among you must become your servant. Whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. Even the Son of Man did not come to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So if Jesus wanted to undo the call to greatness or the desire to greatness, to do great things with your life, right here was the perfect opportunity for him. He could have said, forget about being great. But instead, he says, if you want to be great, I'm going to show you how to do it. And he says, follow my example and my instruction. He says, you want to be great? There's a pathway to be great in every area of your life. Here's how you're going to do it. You're going to serve. And it's why we're doing Serve Team Sunday today, because we want to do more than just attract church attenders. We want to make disciples. And you can't really fully become a disciple following Christ unless you're serving and giving your life away. Somehow, some way, so that others can hear and know that there's a God who loves and saves. And so come on, look for a place to get connected, to, to, to let us help you, to find a place where you could begin to serve and give your life away. If, any, if there was ever a moment where Jesus could have just kind of undone this idea that we might desire to be great, this was the moment. If there was ever a person who could demand or deserve to be treated by us with servanthood, it was Jesus, but he did the opposite. He came and he laid his life down so that we might know what it looks like to truly serve. I heard a story, and it reminds me of the gospel. It's the story of a, of a prince whose father, the king, in a great kingdom, came to the prince and he said, it's about time, son, for you to find a bride and to make her the future queen of the kingdom. The son took it to heart. He began watching and looking and he said, went to his father and he said, he said, dad, I know I have access to many other royal families and lineages from which to select my bride from surrounding kingdoms. But he said, there's a young lady who has caught my attention. She's a common girl. And she shows up and she works faithfully in her father's shop day by day. I've watched her. She's a beautiful girl inside and out. And the father said, well, son, this is, this is not the way we would normally do this, but I, I want you to marry for love and be happy. He said, what can I do for you? And the son said, I would like for you to give me permission to go and to just live amongst her, to go and get a job, to move into the community, to begin to, to earn her, her love and to earn her affection in a way that I know is based on the context of her loving me for who I really am, not for the crown that I wear. And the father said, sounds like a good plan. He went and he moved and he began to work. He began to go into, in and out of her father's shop and interact with her and converse with her. And they began to fall in love with one another. And several years later, he went back to his, to his father and he said, I'm going to ask her to marry me. And he went back to that girl and he said, would you marry me? And she said, yes. They were madly in love by this time. And, sh and after she said yes, he said, well, there's something I need to tell you. I'm actually the prince of the kingdom and we're going to be living in the castle on the top of the hill. And this woman became the greatest queen of all time for two reasons. One is that she knew who she really belonged to, and it was based upon love, not upon any other pretext. And the second reason that she was one of the greatest queens of all time is because she knew who she was 
but she never forgot where she came from. And it's the way to defeat pride in our lives, is to, to be, become confident in the fact that Jesus loved you so much that he laid down, he took off the royal robe, he took off the royal crown, he came to the humble earth and lived the life of a servant, and he laid his life down to show you how much he really loved you and to win your heart. And when you begin to really know that that's the source of your identity, not the popularity or applause of people, and when you begin to know that now you're royalty, but you realize that it's not because of anything you could ever do, it's only because of Jesus Christ and his work in your life. In other words, you know who you belong to, but you will never forget where you came from. And I don't know about you, but I, I know where I would be without Jesus in my life. And I'm grateful that he came and won my heart. I'm grateful that he was willing to come and live life as a servant. And now he is the great example for us. He doesn't despise greatness. He just resists pride. He calls us to achieve greatness through servanthood. It's going to be true of every, every context, every purpose, every dream, every occupation, every career. There's always a way to make the motivation for whatever it is you do. A doctor, a lawyer, a teacher, a, a stay-at-home mom a professional athlete. There's always a way to make the motivation of what God has called you to do, your dream, your purpose, your destiny, serving others in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's the pathway to receiving more grace from God. Come on, once again, how many want more grace from God? So we all have a dream. We all have a dream. We all have to pass the test of pride. Number three of seven truths about a God-given dream is your dream should always be bigger than you and a blessing to others. Let me encourage you with something. Don't relegate yourself to a dream that you can accomplish yourself. Let, let me say that again. Don't limit yourself to a dream that you can accomplish yourself. It ought to be bigger than you. It ought to cause you and call you to desperately need God to show up in your life. It ought to cause you and call you to need to live by faith and not by sight. It ought to cause you. Let me say it this way. If your dream for your life doesn't scare you a little, it's probably too little of a dream. There ought to be something that God is stirring in your heart. And again, this is not, we tend to just kind of immediately just think about career and job and occupation. Maybe there's a version of your marriage, your family, your ministry that is kind of going to cause you and call you to kind of step out of the boat a little and begin to live differently, think differently, pursue some things differently. If your dream doesn't scare you a little, your dream is probably too little. It should require you to desperately need God in your life. I love what David said in 1 Chronicles 14, verse 11, after one of the greatest victories that David ever experienced, and he experienced many. It says that they came to Baal Perazim, and David defeated them there. And David said, God has broken through my enemies by my hand like the breakthrough of waters. He said, my hand was involved, but God gets the glory. This is David right here with the light shining and the cameras in his face after they've won the bowl game, after they've won the World Series, after they've won the Super Bowl. And David is saying, first, I'd like to thank my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, because it's only because of his hand upon my life and the grace that he's put on my life that I even have the opportunity to be standing here today. And some people mock that, but I'm telling you, it's a good commitment to make that when the lights are shining upon you, the light that shines from within you is brighter than those lights that shine upon you. And just predetermine right now, anything as, I, as we embrace, this is important, laying some foundations here. As we're going to be a church, be a people that, that, that dream, that, that, that receive a big vision that... And, and, and some of you are hearing this this morning and you're feeling like, I'm too old, I'm too far gone or whatever. I'm telling you, God is not done with you. God is not done with you. There's still an opportunity and an invitation from the Holy Spirit to step into some things in the future of your life. And, and David said, it's, it's by my hand, but God's going to get the glory. Let me answer a couple questions. How can I know God's dream for my life? This is, the, this is the, absolutely the number one answer to the number one question that people ask. And here's the answer. Get to know the giver of the dream. God is the one who knows you, wired you, is calling you. Get to know the giver of the dream. In other words, begin to listen, begin to hear, begin to read, begin to apprehend more about what God says about who you are than what you think about yourself or what others say about you. Jeremiah 1.5 says this, Before I formed you in the womb, God speaking to you, I knew you. 
Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as prophet to the nations. He's speaking to Jeremiah, but it's true about every one of us. Before God even formed you in the womb, he knew you, he formed you, he set you apart, and he created, an, he appointed you to a purpose. It's why you can afford to be disappointed, you can afford to be discouraged, but you can't afford to stay disappointed or discouraged. Did you catch that? He said, I appointed you. And have we ever thought about disappointment? It mean, I mean, I know it's kind of felt like we perceive it in our emotions, like I'm disappointed. But did you know if you stay in an atti- attitude of disappointment, it can actually cause you to, to be removed from the appointment of purposes of God for your life. He says, I, before I formed you, I knew you. I set you apart. I appointed you. So number one, get to know God. He's the giver of the dream. You want to know the dream for your life? Get to know the giver of the dream. One of the greatest things that comes along with a relationship with God and living by faith is we begin to hear God's perspective about who we are. Number two is discover a dream that is about serving others. It should always be about serving, helping, blessing others. I know this is a little cheesy what I'm about to say, okay, but I'm going to just own it and I'm going to say it. Because sometimes it's these kind of things that kind of stick with us the most. Watch this. The moment that my dream begins to become about me, myself, and I is the moment where the favor, the grace, and the anointing of God says bye-bye. You want the favor of God? I don't know about you, but I want the favor of God. I want the grace of God. I want the anointing of God. I want the support of God. And we want that. We got to begin to make our, our dream, our vision, our calling, our purpose about people around us. It's what attracts the heart and the favor and the grace of God over our lives. We tend to focus on what we're called to do, and that's fine, but maybe the better thing to focus on is why am I doing this, and for whom am I doing it? Am I doing it for myself, or am I doing it to really truly bring glory to God and be a blessing to God's people? A self-serving dream is a self-conceived dream, and a self-conceived dream will almost always be a self-accomplished dream. There's a dream for your life that you can go and pursue, that's your version, your thought, your preference, your opinion, your perspective, your idea, but get prepared to just do it in your own strength. There's a vision, there's a dream from your life that is from God, that's intended to bring glory to him and be a blessing to others. And when you begin to own that dream in every area of life, you better watch out the support, the the favor, the protection, the provision, the open doors of God are coming for you. Second Chronicles 69 says, the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth looking for someone to show strong support towards, someone whose heart is blameless towards him. I want your heart to be blameless towards God. Win the battle over pride and say, God, the dream you put in my heart, let it never be about me. Let it be about you, and let it be about blessed, being a blessing to others. Number four, I gotta move quickly. Truths about a big God-sized dream for your life. Number four, be prepared for some people, and in parentheses here, I just wrote most people, to despise you for daring to dream, especially if you dream big. Joseph's brothers, right from the start, he had a big dream and they, he had haters right from the start. And, and in this church family, can we just determine that we're gonna become so confident and aware of who we are in Christ that we can champion and celebrate other people's dreams and successes? That's an intentional pause right there to let you think about that. And then I think it bears repeating. In this church, can we determine that we're going to become so aware and confident of our own identity in Christ and his hand upon our life that we can enthusiastically champion the dreams of others and celebrate their successes? How many of you know that's a challenge in some places? Jealousy and envy can begin to operate. Man, one of my greatest successes and victories as a pastor is watching you guys succeed in life. Watching you guys succeed in marriage. Watching you guys. Watching you young people get a God-given dream for your life and go chase it down. And, and, and break through all the obstacles and all the opposition. And not just discover it, but fulfill it and enjoy it. A God-sized dream will almost always challenge the status quo. And going with the flow will almost always lead you to an average life. Wright brothers, or- Orville and Wilmer, they don't name them like they used to, right? <laughs> they had a dream that they could build something that could break the gravitational forces and fly. They told them, you're crazy, it can't be done. Alexander Graham Bell invented the telephone. And I, I got some pictures here I want to show you. This, I, I know i got to move quick, but this is fun. I don't want to skip it. The first picture is the phone that Alexander Graham Bell made his famous phone call to his assistant Watson. Watson, I need to see you. And 
That's what, that's what Alexander Graham Bell saw, but he, he never saw or conceived the phone that you have in your pocket today, right? All the ways that it's advanced. Moving on, the phone went from that, and then, this is not perfect chronology, but this is just kind of a snapshot of how this developed over time. If you had one of those in your house, you are old, sorry to, to tell you. If you had one of these in your house, you're my age, because that's the phone that I grew up with. That thing was hanging. It was a little different color. It's like a mustard yellow, but it was hanging in my folks' kitchen, and, and we got smart, you know. We eventually got like an 84-foot cord, you know, <laughs> that would hang down and wrap around the ground, and your remember it would get all tangled up. It was long enough for my mom to simultaneously talk to her sister, peel potatoes, and give my brother and I a whooping all at the same time. <laughs> There's a cell phone for you, younger, young folks. Who, whoever, who had a bag phone? You remember that? I went into business right out of high school. Most of my friends went to college. I was the first one of all my friends to have a cell phone, and that was the one right there. Then we had this. Who, I, I, that, we literally had that phone in my house. Remember the antenna at the top that you could put out and you had to kind of move around? And remember occasionally you could even hear the phone calls of your neighbors? That was a good day. You know, that was interesting. It made, made life interesting. Then that's another one of the first cell phones. That's actually not real. That's an inflatable phone. Who even knew they made that? That's the actual phone. When we broke free of the bag phone, weighed a thousand pounds, but it was mobile. How many of you remember that phone? How many of you had that phone? How many of you remember playing Snake? You remember, had one game, Snake, you remember? How many of you had that one too? That was a, yeah. 2007, iPhone was invented. You know an interesting fact about Alexander Graham Bell? In fact, can you go back, is it possible for you to go back and put that first one up on the screen again? Did you know that, that when Alexander Graham Bell invented that phone right there, I was reading about it, as I was preparing to just kind of use this as an illustration, and I was reading about it, and Alexander Graham Bell with that phone right there, listen to this. He said, I do not want to have this phone in my office, or it will create a distraction and an interruption to my work and studies. That phone. Here's the point. The dream that God puts in your heart might even be bigger than what you ever see on this side of eternity. You pursue your dream, your vision, your plan, your purpose. Alex, Alexander Graham Bell, he saw that, but he never saw what you have in your hand right here, but he's the originator of it. Pursuing your dream, pursuing your purpose could lead to things that in future generations that you only get to see from the other side of eternity. Go ahead and stand to your feet this morning. I got a couple more points, but I just feel like it's a good place to stop. Maybe a couple of these points will just come out kind of in the closing ministry. Joseph found himself in a pit, and God never promised you that you wouldn't find yourself in a pit even as you're pursuing God's purpose for your life. Maybe you're here today and you say, Pastor T, I can relate to that. I, I, I stepped out, but I'm, I've, I've been put in or I've fallen in. And both are very relevant. There are some pits that people will put you in, and there's some pits that we just kind of dig for ourselves and climb into huh? because of our own decisions or choices. Conviction is the voice of the Holy Spirit coming to you when you find yourself in a pit. Conviction is the voice of the Holy Spirit trying to help you to get out of the pit. Condemnation is the voice of the enemy trying to keep you there. Condemnation is broad and general. Conviction is very specific. Here's what I mean by that. Conviction comes into my life and the Holy Spirit says, Thomas, I don't like the way that you spoke to your wife or your kids. And it's almost always a whisper. 
But when that spirit of conviction comes, Thomas, I, you, you shouldn't have spoken that way. Use that tone. Inevitably, my heart just goes, oh, God, you're right. Thanks for bringing me that conviction and helping me to go and make it right. With my kids who I, whom I maybe yelled at or disciplined in anger, toward my wife who I was maybe sharp or short with or whatever it is. So that's conviction. Condemnation comes and says, you are a terrible husband and you'll never be anything else. You're just like so-and-so or you'll never amount to anything. Or you're... Why do they even, they, you, they'd be better off without you in their life. That's the voice of condemnation. And today the Lord comes with his gentle voice of conviction. If you're in a pit today, he wants to help you to get out. You, maybe what, whatever's put you there. Pride, a lack of faith, someone's unforeseen, unexpected circumstances. He wants to get you there. He, he's, he's still in the business of rescuing us from the pit. Okay, remember I said we'd close by going back and referencing Reuben. Remember the firstborn. Remember the firstborn that wanted to rescue Joseph? And remember what it said? He wanted to rescue Joseph from the pit and restore him back to his father, right? Did you know that the Bible describes Jesus as the firstborn of all creation? And he's the one that wants to rescue you from the pit and restore you back to a relationship with your father. This whole story, the whole Bible, is all pointing to Jesus and his work on the cross. Joseph was favored by his father. Jesus was favored by his father. Joseph was betrayed by Judah. Jesus was betrayed by Judah. Same name, just the difference between Hebrew and Greek. Joseph was stripped of his robe. Jesus was stripped of his robe and beaten. Joseph went through the pit to end up at the palace. Jesus came and through that cross went to the pit to to take back forever the keys of sin and death and the grave. And now he went through that pit, but he's in the greatest palace, the greatest place, seated at the right hand of God forever and ever and ever. And he's still the God of restoration and rescue. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, forget not his benefits, who forgives your iniquity, heals your disease, and redeems your life from the pit. If you're grateful for a God who's still rescuing and restoring and redeeming and bringing dreams and bringing hope and bringing faith for the future. Okay, so I know we're running a minute or two late, but we cannot close our service without giving people the opportunity to come home to Christ to say yes to the free gift of salvation. If you're here today and you're weighed down by that that condemnation, guilt, shame, the sin that trips us up and keeps us from moving forward, today's the day of salvation for you. Or if you're here today and you've just drifted from God, maybe you once had a relationship with God, but you just drifted, gotten preoccupied with the cares of this world, maybe made some bad choices or decisions. If that's you today, either one of those camps or anywhere in between, Right now, don't wait, right now. The arms of the Father are the same towards you as they were in that parable that Jesus told about the prodigal son. Arms wide open, looking for, eagerly waiting, anticipating and expecting this moment in your life where you would just take one step back towards Christ. And here's the step I wanna ask you to take right now. There'll be others that God will call you to take, but right now, here's the step I wanna ask you to take. Would you unashamedly put your hand high in the air and say, that's me, I need a new life, a fresh start, forgiveness of sins. I need to come back into my Father's house, into a relationship with my Heavenly Father. If that's you in this room and online, boldly, unashamedly lift your hand high towards heaven. You're not responding to a preacher, you're responding to your Father. Lord, we just thank you. Thank you. I see you, young man. Thank you for the work that God's doing in your life. There's a new day. There's a new future. From this day forward, things are going to be different. Things are going to be different. The Bible says all the old things pass away, and you become a new creation in Christ Jesus. That's what's happening in your life right now. One more moment. Anyone else who wants to join this moment and receive the free gift of salvation? Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Lord, I don't know your story, young lady, but God's got a future. He's not finished with you. And that's a lie that the enemy's tried to tell you. And I see open doors in your your future. I see God beginning to just revisit some things that maybe you thought were dormant or dead or dying. And God's God's bringing resurrection life, not just to you, 
today through this commitment, this decision, but to some dreams and things that maybe have grown dormant in your life today. So here's what we're going to do. Let's pray this prayer together with these people who have responded. Let's pray it boldly and with some fresh conviction today. Come on, repeat after me. Say, Father, in Jesus' mighty name, I recognize my need for a Savior. I thank you for sending Jesus to pay the price I could never pay to make a way that I might have a new life and a fresh start. I give you my life. I give you my trust. And because of Jesus, come on, say this part loudly. I will never be the same. And then rejoice with all of heaven for these precious people. Man, thank you, Lord.